So it's been a busy weekend uh, for several of us here at Christchurch. Um, my wife and I, we moved. I know Rachel and GT moved houses here in town. Uh, I am exceedingly sore this morning. Uh, but in the middle of the move, we went to uh, go have lunch as a group. And I tried to pay for lunch at our, one of our favorite Mexican food restaurants. And somebody beat me to it for the group. Uh, but there's something wonderful about Mexican food, isn't there? I mention that because you'll, you'll hear it in the sermon. But hear now these words from John chapter 6. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. The word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. So as I mentioned, we love Mexican food in my house. We love it. We love Tex-Mex, we love Mexican, but when we lived in North Carolina, we had a hard time finding good Tex-Mex, as you can imagine. So imagine our relief when we found out shortly after we moved to this little podunk town in, Spring, in North Carolina called Spring Hope, about 30 minutes outside of Raleigh, that they were going to open the very first Chewies in the state of North Carolina in Raleigh, North Carolina. That first night that they opened up, every single Texan who was attending Duke Divinity School, we all met at Chewy's that night. We had a hard time finding good Tex-Mex. We had a hard time finding good Mexican food. Over time, we found a couple other passable places. But there was something that happened at every Mexican food restaurant that we would eat at that drove us absolutely nuts. What do you call melted cheese with peppers and spices that you dip chips into? Queso. Queso. We would go to a restaurant and we would order queso for an appetizer and the waiter every time would look at us and go, you mean cheese dip? <laughs> now technically they were right because queso just means cheese, but for a Texan, queso means queso. For a Texan, a meal at a Tex-Mex restaurant or a Mexican food restaurant is, with few exceptions, incomplete without queso. Queso is life, y'all. Similarly, we had a hard time finding good tortillas in North Carolina, so imagine our gratefulness when we move back to Texas and we have an HEB in our backyard where they make fresh tortillas on the spot. Queso and tortillas. Other cultures now and throughout history just don't know what they've, missing, what they've missed out on not knowing about queso. But each culture and each 
society around the world and throughout history has their own signature food item, something that accompanies almost every meal. Often it's, it's a grain product or a bread. Think of rice in global cultures. Bread is almost universal around the, ro around the globe. Think of nam bread in Indian cuisine, pita bread in the Middle Eastern cuisines, the various types of bread found all across Europe and all across Africa. And America did its part with the glorious gift of Hawaiian bread. Humanity loves bread. Going back into the earliest of human history, forms of bread have been a key part of human diets throughout history. Evidences of bread making stretch back some 30,000 years ago. Bread and bread making have deep cultural significance for human beings. There's something about bread that's just comforting. One of the things that I do when I'm stressed or overwhelmed is to pause in the midst of whatever is going on and to make a loaf of bread. There's something about the measuring and the preparing of the ingredients, about kneading the dough and then patiently waiting for it to rise that helps me to gain perspective. The smell of the bread as it bakes in the oven is maybe one of the best smells in the entire world. There's something about the process of bread making, about the waiting, that helps me to, to slow down and to think clearly. When writing this sermon, I realized that I baked a fair amount of bread while I was in school and in seminary. In the midst of a hard paper where things weren't coming together right, I would bake a loaf of bread. But I realized that, weirdly enough, I haven't baked a loaf of bread since I graduated seminary. It says a lot right there about what seminary is like. Bread. Jesus himself would have been quite familiar with bread and would have eaten it often. In our passage this morning that we just read, Jesus declares that he is the bread of life. The image of bread, a staple food for so many cultures throughout history, is powerful. Jesus was speaking in imagery that his listeners would understand. I am the bread of life. If Jesus had been speaking Texan that morning, perhaps he would have said, I am the tortilla of life. We would immediately understand what Jesus was saying. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. People can understand this image, but Christ's declaration here this morning is even more significant because of what Jesus had just done just before that passage. Jesus had just performed one of his iconic miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 men not knowing how many women or children were there. We have no idea how large that crowd really was. He fed them with bread. And after the crowd had eaten its fill, Jesus and his disciples get up and travel to Capernaum. And the crowd starts looking for Jesus and they set out looking for him. And they find him just outside of Capernaum. Jesus sees the crowd coming and he addresses them knowing what they are looking for. The first thing that Jesus says to the crowd is, you are looking for me. Not because of the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and because you had your fill. We pray every Sunday morning, give us this day our daily bread. This crowd goes looking for it. They get up and go find Jesus. Give us bread, Jesus. But then Jesus takes the conversation in a way that I expect very few were anticipating. They're there looking for food, something to take the pangs of hunger away. And Jesus says to them, do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life. These people are hungry, and it seems somehow a bit callous to say to hungry people that working for normal food is foolish. But is Jesus wrong? Jesus is trying to get to a deeper issue, to get to the heart of the problem. They're focused on one need, and Jesus is speaking about another. These people are hungry, and if he feeds them again like he did the day before, they'll just be hungry again. The people are hungry, yes, but there is a deeper need in their lives, perhaps one they don't even realize they have, perhaps one they lack words for. 
Jesus says that what people should pursue are those things that lead instead to eternal life, those things that only Christ can give. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. In our narrative, as I read it, I imagine there to be a collective pause as they try to wrestle and to figure out what Jesus is saying, and the people ask then what they must do to get this food. It seems very similar to the Samaritan woman who Jesus met beside a well, where she asked Jesus what she must do to get the living water that Jesus spoke of so that she doesn't have to come back to the well every day to draw more water. Give me this water. This crowd that walked around the Sea of Galilee to find, a Jesus, to find Jesus again seems to want Jesus to teach them how to work for the food that never spoils, never goes bad, and is never wasted. So they won't be hungry again, so that they may live easier lives. Give a man a fish and he'll be hungry again, the saying goes. But teach a man to fish and he'll never be hungry again. These people want Jesus to teach them how to get that food so they will never be hungry again. And so Jesus answers their question about what kind of work they, may, they must do. And being good Jewish listeners, maybe they were expecting him to talk about giving a sacrifice or a commandment to do something or not to do something. After all, they were used to the Old Testament religious law and they were speaking to a rabbi. But Jesus says all that they have to do is believe in him. This doesn't satisfy the crowd. It's too easy. And where's the bread? They want to know what Jesus, if Jesus is really the one sent from God, so they ask Jesus to prove it. Our ancestors ate the manna from heaven. Can you do better? And here I have to laugh at the crowd. They ask for a sign, and the sign they want is one from long ago, long in their memories, that just so happens to match what they're after. We're hungry, so prove that you're the one sent from God by giving us bread, by replicating the miracle God did before, by giving bread from heaven. It's almost like me if I was walking home from work and I'm hot and I'm tired and I ask, I'm hot and tired, God, if you're really there, give me a car with air conditioning. They're asking Jesus to prove he is who he says he is by doing what they want. But this isn't really how God works, is it? Jesus tries again to get the message through. God gives true bread, the bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Only God gives the bread that meets the very real needs of humanity. And it seems here that the crowd loses their patience a little bit. Sir, always give us this bread. We're hungry and you keep talking about bread. Please, just give us this bread. And after what had to have been a dramatic pause, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But... But Jesus knows that the people haven't yet understood him. They haven't believed in him, haven't really believed in him. They're just using Jesus to meet their needs, to get what they wanted. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father will give me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. This is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. Jesus is the bread of life that can meet their needs. Jesus is the bread of life, the word of God incarnate, sent to fill what some writers in our recent history have termed the God-shaped hole in our lives. And people will try to fill it with all manner of things. Some in our world try to fill that longing by abusing drugs or alcohol. Others have tried to fill that longing with temporary relationships and meaningless sex. Some have tried to meet that hunger within with actual food, but the hunger always returns. And still yet, others have tried to find satisfaction in, for their lives 
through endless work and temporary possessions. We live in a time and we live in a place where we are told that hard work is all it takes to get all that you would ever want. We've been told by some that the reason some people are poor and go without is because of some character defect. If they would just work hard, they wouldn't be poor. We are told that happiness is contained in stuff. Buy this product, drive this car, wear this brand, and you'll be happy and fulfilled. In 2017, in the United States alone, $190 billion was spent on advertising last year. One-fifth of $1 trillion was spent by companies trying to sell us something, something we probably didn't really need in the first place. In fact, we have so much stuff that Americans have to rent space to store it. 2017, again, just last year, Americans spent $38 billion on self-storage facilities. There's now approximately seven, feet, seven square feet of storage for every single American. 10% of Americans rent storage, spending an average of $100 a month on space for stuff. As a society, we work longer hours, we buy more stuff, have more debt, take fewer vacations, and are unhappier than we've ever been in decades. Americans, it seems, to quote you too, we still haven't found what it is we're looking for. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that things are bad. Things are just things, in and of themselves, morally and spiritually neutral. I'm not saying that we shouldn't work. What I am saying is that we're not meant to just work, to pay bills, and then die. What I am saying is that a nice house, a nice car, and nice food won't meet our heart's deepest desires, and that is to be truly loved. The things of this world aren't a problem in and of themselves, but when they're used to try to meet a need that only God can fill, there's the problem. This is what Jesus is saying when he says, do not work for food that spoils, but instead work for those things that lead to eternal life. We are created for eternity with God, and what will satisfy the longing of our hearts is also eternal. What we need most is the bread of life, the bread that won't just sustain life, but the bread that is life and gives life. This bread isn't something that we can earn. No amount of work can earn it. There's nothing we can give to give it. We can't buy it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. The bread of life sent from heaven is a gift from God. And all we can do is receive it by believing in the one who is sent from God, Jesus Christ. We can't be too bad to never deserve it. Nothing we have ever done excludes us from receiving the gift that God offers us. Jesus says that it is my Father's will that everyone, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. No matter who we are, if we just believe in him, really believe in him, not for what we might hope to get out of the deal. If we just believe in him, we shall be saved. And then when we have received that bread of life, our hearts will never be hungry again, never be thirsty again. When we have received the greatest gift that could ever be given, what else could we ever really want? Jesus invites all to come and to be filled, to find life and to truly live now and forever with God. In just a few moments, we'll be invited to the table that Christ sets before us. And as we kneel to receive a bit of bread, and a bit of wine. If we pause, we might catch a glimpse of that eternal feast with Jesus and with God forever, where we will never be hungry and never be thirsty again. Jesus says he is the bread of life. Let us believe and be filled. Be thou my vision, not be all else to me, save that thou art. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.